So how about the concept of these people being dangerous? Well, difficult as it is to find objective medical research on this, there is indication that the stereotype of thinking those with SRA backgrounds are all dangerous, or even that the majority are dangerous, is also unjustifiable. The impression from Dizdar's book is that all SRA victims are dangerous, but the one research study I found which covered this did not bear the stereotype out. Some may be under particular circumstances, but the vast majority are not, according to more objective research. The research bore out the opposite of Dizdar's claims and prejudice. Before getting to those figures, I would like to put them in an accurate perspective. The mental health field, including therapists and social workers, of those working with mentally ill people of whatever sort, who some Christians would argue generally have some level of demonic oppression across the variety of mental illnesses, uh, working in the mental health field does carry some risk. In one study of 1,129 social workers, it was found that 50% had received a threat from a client, 25% had experienced property damage, and 24% had experienced physical attack from a client. Another study of 178 counselors at a counseling center found that 64% had experienced some form of harassing behavior from a client. Additionally, 5.6% had been stalked by a client or a former client, and 8% had had a family member stalked, and 10% had someone they supervised stalked by a client or former client. In a third study I found on prediction of violence based on certain variables, how th well therapy is going, it is generally estimated that on average there is an 8 to 12% chance of an act of physical assault from a client. And that's based on factors of the, the level of need for treatment, if treatment is effective or not effective, and the client's adherence to the treatment. Now, these statistics cover the mental health field in general, including clients experiencing a variety of mental health conditions and possibly levels of demonic oppression. So let's compare this to research on SRA. This is not research on MPD, and the overlap is unknown. So just on SRA, around 225 therapists were asked if victims of SRA, ritual abuse, or mind control abuse had threatened or harmed them. Now, the results were that 35% of the therapists had been threatened by a client of who was an RA or mind control SRA victim, and that was while in therapy, and 7% had been threatened by an RAMC victim after therapy had ceased. This is contrasted with being harmed by a client, not threatened, but harmed by a client, and the results were 7% of therapists reported harm from a client during therapy, and 4% reported harm after therapy had ceased. So, the percentages seen with SRA, RA, mind control victims and their therapists are lower percentages than in comparison to the general mental health field of therapists and their clients. For the general mental health field, threats are seen to be 50%, but with those that are RA, SRA, mind control, those victims, the threats from those clientele are only 35%, so we have 50 versus 35. Um, for the general mental health field, violent attacks are 24%, but for RA or mind control victims, the highest rate that can be assumed is only 7%. Now, as to stalking, uh, defining that as after therapy is, is ceased, the general mental health field is somewhere between 5.6 and 10%, but for RA or MC victims, the stalking rate is 7%, which is right at the same as average. If we looked at 5.6 plus 8 plus 10 divided by 3, we're looking at 7.9%. So 7% which is right at the same as average for the general mental health field of 7.9%, or actually it is just below average. Of course, these figures are just estimates and statistics, but nevertheless, more objective medical research of the mental health field compared to more objective research on ritual abuse and, and mind control in particular, victims of that, uh, it supports the exact opposite of what Dizdar claims. You can see links uh, for some of this information in, in wherever the source is for this. Now, what can be supported by more objective research is not that all SRA victims are dangerous, or even that the majority are. 
but rather the minority of about 7% are dangerous, at least that that can be supported, and about 35% can be threatening. But compared to the average client in the mental health field, SRA victims are less likely to make threats than average. That's 35% versus 50%. And at this, that is still only 35% of SRA victims, which is clearly the minority of SRA victims and not the majority of them. Now, more importantly, compared to the average client in the mental health field, SRA victims are less likely to cause actual harm than average, playing 7% versus 24%. And at this, that is a whopping 93% of SRA victims who have not caused harm to therapists, which is the overwhelming majority of them. As to stalking, SRA victims seem no more likely to stalk therapists than your average person that's a client in the mental health field. And they seem to be no more dangerous than average. In fact, everything indicates from this that SRA victims are less dangerous than the average client in the mental health field. There is simply no support in this more objective research uh, for Dizdar's claims that SRA victims should be singled out as more dangerous than your average person with mental health issues. And in fact, the opposite appears to be true. Additionally, the stereotype that comes from Dizdar's teachings, the stereotype that all SRA victims are dangerous, appears to be unfounded. Prejudice is never justifiable or right, but in this case it seems to be especially inaccurate. To where if you met someone with SRA, according to Dizdar's figures, you could pretty much almost assume they are a satanic super soldier as part of the Black Awakening and that they're dangerous. But according to, to these figures, in fact, you're only looking at maybe 35% chance that they might be threatening and only a 7% chance that they'd cause harm. Whereas if you met anyone uh, who's a client of uh, having some sort of mental illness or seeking counseling, the rate for them would be 50% for being threatening and 24% for causing harm. So. You know, if you if you meet an SRA victim, you're looking at a 93% chance that they're not actually dangerous. And you're looking at a 65% chance they're not going to be threatening. And that's that's the majority of them. So what, what should, you know, stereotypes are wrong, but what should the stereotype be? The stereotype should be that they're not particularly dangerous or, or likely to be threatening and are less likely to be dangerous or threatening than just on average in the mental health field of somebody who's seeking counseling or therapy. Well, that's the exact opposite by far of what Dizdar is teaching, according to what objective research I could find on this. So let's look at the earlier figures. And the earlier figures is that it seemed like 0.01 up to 1% of the population might have MPD. And of those, 25 to 50% of those would have SRA, okay? So when we figured out at 0.01%, that might be one out of 20,000 to one out of 40,000 people who in the general population would have MPD and, and SRA. And at 1%, that would be 1 in 200 to 1 in 400 people of the general population who would have MPD and also have SRA. Okay, now based on these new figures, it would seem of those who have SRA, only 35% of these people would be likely to make threats and only 7% are likely to cause harm. Okay, we factor those in just looking at our ranges. At the absolute worst, that might be 1 in 600 people to 1 in 1,200 people who have SRA and MPD and are likely to make threats. And at best, that's only 1 in 60,000 people to 1 in 120,000 people in the general population who are SRA and MPD and are likely to make threats. So looking at the 7% that are actually likely to cause harm, uh, moving on to that, at worst, that is 1 in 2,800 to 1 in 5,600 people who are SRA and MPD and are likely to cause harm in the general population. But at best, at 0.01%, 
factoring in only 25 to 50 percent of those with MPD have SRA and looking at only 7 percent of those with SRA being likely to cause harm. That figures out to 1 in 280,000 to 1 in 560,000 people in the general population who are SRA and have MPD and are likely to cause harm. Okay, so, so those are our ranges there. And to put this in perspective with the population of a major city uh, like Nashville, being reported to be about 590,800 people. Okay, so at the very absolute worst, doing the math out, that is one to 200 people in all of Nashville who might be SRA, MPD, and are likely to cause harm. Out of all the 590,800 people living in Nashville, there might be one or 200 people like this. But at best, using figures that seem frankly more realistic, of 0.01%, that would only be one or two people in all of Nashville who might actually be SRA and MPD and are likely to cause harm. And closer to this does seem to be the more realistic figure. But at the very worst, using the highest figures, that still means there is a 99.9996428% chance that any person you meet or know is not an SRA and MPD uh, hidden satanic super soldier that's likely to harm you. Okay, there's a 99.9996428 chance any person that you meet or know is not a hidden satanic super soldier. Okay, that's the math here. Now, with only 25 to 50 percent of those with MPD actually being SRA, the, and, and only 7 percent of those being likely to cause harm, that means that anyone you meet or know who actually discloses MPD to you only has a 1.8 to 3.6 percent chance of being SRA and likely to cause harm. Okay, just flipping that around, it means that anyone you meet or know who discloses MPD to you has a 96.4 to 98.2 chance of not being SRA and likely to cause harm. Uh, and that's whether you know if they have SRA in their background or not. And so what we're looking at here is not whatsoever that one in 30 people is a hidden satanic super soldier likely to go on the mass killing spree someday or be doing these disgusting or evil sinful things. Um, it's not one in 30 people. No, if you meet someone, there's a 99% chance, over 99.999% chance that any person you meet or know is not a satanic super soldier. And even if you meet someone who discloses MPD, there's still a 96 to 98% chance of them not being SRA and likely to cause harm, to harm you. And that's whether you know if they are SRA or not. And so going back to looking at Dizdar's figures of, of 1 in 30 people and the idea that 95% of those with MPD are dangerous, okay, that, that's what the book is, The Black Awakening is saying, is that 95% of those with MPD are SRA or mind control and are dangerous. They're these satanic super soldiers as well. According to more objective medical research, uh, no. You're looking actually at 96 to 98 percent and not being SRA and likely to harm you. So we compare Dizdar's 95 percent are likely hidden satanic super soldiers that are, are capable of harming you and are dangerous. And it's like, no, this research is saying the exact opposite, really 96 to 98 percent chance that they're not dangerous, whether they've had SRA or not. And so the stereotype and prejudice of people with MPD, there's a 95% chance that they're a satanic super soldier hidden or whatever, and uh, that they're going to, you know, that they're dangerous. It's like, no, reality does not support this. Reality supports the opposite of of over 95%, 96 to 98%, that they're not SRA and likely to cause harm. You don't even know, you don't even have to know if they have SRA or not. That's what objective research supports. And, and it's not a 1 in 30 chance. I just 
focus on these numbers that the stereotypes that Dizdar is teaching are false. They cannot, they're not backed by objective medical research, they're not backed by reality of what can be verified. They're prejudice. Even so, with that being said, let's talk about the people who are dangerous. Let's talk about the 7% minority of SRA victims who might cause harm and are dangerous, or the 35% minority of SRA victims who may make upsetting threats. What about any people with SRA and MPD, and victims of SRA who have MPD, who do exist out there and who, in fact, are dangerous, okay? Now, obviously, Russ Dizdar has come across some of these people, but this is his specialty, and people refer them to him, and they come to him. This is, he's working with the worst cases. He's working with the worst cases, so he's working with that 7% okay more likely than a lot of people being inside of that seven percent minority of sra victims who are likely to cause harm working within that minority of the 35 percent of sra victims who make threats that's the bubble that he's been working in okay and when you're inside a bubble like that, it can start to seem like all of reality is that way. But the reality is, there seems to be a lot of people that send some of the worst cases to Russ. And so he's ending up working with that 7% minority, that 35% minority. Very hard. Hard job of him be, would be for anyone. Try to give some perspective on why this is so off from the objective research I could find. Um, it's a matter of perception in that bubble. Now, even if these people, SRA and MPD victims who do exist out there who are dangerous, at 7% minority, at 35% that may make threats, now, even if these people are quote-unquote fake Christians, even if they are everything that Dizdar claims them to be, Jesus Christ's clear instructions to Christians about enemies and evil people leave no room for prejudice and hateful treatment. Matthew 5, 38-44 Ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye, and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Again, even if these people are fake Christians and everything that Dizdar claims them to be, everything that Dizdar claims them to be, Jesus Christ's clear instructions to Christians about enemies and evil people leave no room for prejudice and hateful treatment. Luke six twenty seven through 38 But I say unto you which hear, Love your enemies, do good to them which hate you, bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak, forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee. And of him that taketh away thy goods, ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great, and ye shall be the children of the highest. For he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. Be ye therefore merciful, as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. 
forgive and ye shall be forgiven give and it shall be given unto you good measure pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom for with the same measure that ye meet withal it shall be measured to you again mark eleven twenty five through twenty six and when ye stand praying forgive if ye have aught against any that your father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses but if ye do not forgive neither will your father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses romans twelve fourteen through twenty one bless them which persecute you bless and curse not rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep be of the same mind one toward another mind not high things but condescend to men of low estate be not wise in your own conceits recompense to no man evil for evil provide things honest in the sight of all men if it be possible as much as lieth in you live peaceably with all men dearly beloved avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath for it is written vengeance is mine i will repay saith the lord therefore if thine enemy hunger feed him if he thirst give him drink for in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good romans thirteen eight through twelve owe no man anything but to love one another for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law for this thou shalt not commit adultery thou shalt not kill thou shalt not steal thou shalt not bear false witness thou shalt not covet and if there be any other commandment it is briefly comprehended in this saying namely thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself love worketh no ill to his neighbour therefore love is the fulfilling of the law and that knowing the time and now it is high time to awake out of sleep for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed the night is far spent the day is at hand let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armour of light regardless of anything no man has the right even a man experienced with working with victims of s r a who have m p d no man has the right to presume the prerogative that his teachings can supersede god's law of love it is not up to him to decide whether he or others should obey it or not no one has the right to make excuses for why they should not have to obey the law of love in regards to a person even if that person is an s r a m p d demoniac we are commanded to love your neighbor as yourself and the actions of every person will be judged by the standard but especially as there is great risk and temptation in these teachings for christians to mistreat christian brethren with prejudice and without love james two one through nine four eleven twelve my brethren do not hold your faith in our glorious lord jesus christ with an attitude of personal favoritism for if a man comes into your assembly with a gold ring and dressed in fine clothes and there also comes in a poor man in dirty clothes and you pay special attention to the one who is wearing the fine clothes and say you sit here in a good place and you say to the poor man you stand over there or, or sit down by my footstool have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil motives listen my beloved brethren did not god choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him but you have dishonored the poor man is it not the rich who oppress you and personally drag you into court do they not blaspheme the fair name by which you have been called if however you are fulfilling the royal law according to scripture you shall love your neighbor as yourself you are doing well but if you show partiality you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors speak not evil of one another brethren he that speaketh evil of brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law but if thou judge the law thou art not a doer of the law but a judge 
There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Is prejudice patient and kind, or is it impatient and mean? Does a smear campaign serve the long-term benefit of the accused, or is it arrogant and acting unbecomingly towards the accused? Does fear and distrust keep a record of wrongs or not? Does rejection from prejudice mean bearing, believing, hoping, and remaining through all things or not? 1 Corinthians 14.1-8a Love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous, envious. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly, it does not seek its own, is not provoked to anger, does not take into account a wrong suffered, keeps no record of wrongs, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, remains all things. Love never fails. 1 John 4, 18, 21. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Christians cannot fear these people and that are other Christians and be loving them at the same time. Christians cannot fear these people and be loving them at the same time, whether they're Christians or not. Dizdar's teachings are encouraging Christians to have fear, prejudice, paranoia, and hate, even hatred towards other Christians. And that shows the bad fruit of these teachings, that they are false and unbiblical. Moving on, the next problem with the impact of these teachings on those in the Christian conspiracy fringe community is the possibility of not just those who with particular backgrounds in the local Christian church, uh, not just them being targeted as being accused of, of being satanic super soldiers and hiding, infiltrating. There's another problem is that really anyone could be targeted according to these teachings from infrequent attendees to established members, even up to the church staff and leadership. Quote, Chosen ones are trained to join a church and begin climbing the ladder of relationships and service. They may even volunteer or seek a job in the group. They want to be a part and will seek the inner workings of the church group. Page 359. Okay, well, let's say they do that and they're successful. They can be working at the church. They could be a regular volunteer. They could be on staff. <laughs> Quote, there are many chosen ones who have been placed in churches who are just quiet and come off and on. Their subpersonalities know the sleeper assassin, maybe waiting for the ultimate call. When this trigger is given, they are to find and kill leaders, cause mayhem and may bomb or burn the building. This is the ultimate goal of having hundreds of thousands of intact sleeper chosen ones planned in the body of Christ. I have found them in many churches, all caps. They are already among you. Page 365 to 366. Quote, there are, in my estimation, hundreds of thousands of intact chosen ones who are placed in churches everywhere they, or at least the presenting host, don't know. They are there to wait for the call. Chosen ones who are sleepers have deep inside of them the program subpersonalities that are demonized and fierce. Page 487. They are everywhere. I have met SRA and PD victims, chosen ones. Remember, there may have been up to 10 million of them, and many more are being forged as you read. Page 453. Okay, so according to Dizdar, these satanic super soldier hidden infiltrators have been targeting churches for infiltration for some time, for years. Uh, many are already in place. They do not even know that they have MPD or SRA in their background. They just seem to be totally normal people, normal Christian people. They make efforts to fit in, to serve and help. They move up the ranks in local churches. He says aiming for the inner workings of the church. Dissart claims they're already placed in main churches, but people are unaware of their presence. They're unaware of what they are. No one else is aware. And this has been going on for years. So 
as such, they could be pretty much anyone in the church, uh, regular attendees or, or volunteers that have been there for years, even deacons or deaconesses, elders, associate pastors, even the senior pastor. In, in many cases, this plan of infiltration has supposedly been taking place for decades. So even if a church might be, you know, 10, 15 years old, or the pastors have been on staff for 8, 10, longer, it really makes no difference, p potentially. There really are few limits on who could be accused of being one of these satanic super soldier infiltrators, according to these teachings. Now, these false teachings literally have the potential to tear a church apart especially if suspicions against key church members or church leadership are raised. And that is besides these teachings, these false teachings having the potential to tear apart the life of an individual Christian. And that would be those both accused and the accusers. There, there is potentially further harm to those who believe these teachings coming out of them. For those who believe these teachings and follow these teachings, the prejudice involved, the capacity to be able to harden your heart against another person, even another Christian, is something which is hard to limit in its growth potential. I mean, if you become capable of prejudice and acting hateful to one person, even a Christian, or to one group of people, then you have developed a capacity inside for prejudice and hatred. And once you have that capacity for prejudice and hatred, you know, that can grow and that can spread to be targeted at other people, other Christians, other groups of people. Now, for anyone like that, it works in opposition to spiritual growth and maturity as a Christian. A Christian who believes these teachings and follows them might develop a capacity for fear, prejudice, and, and hateful actions only towards one person or group of people at first. But once that capacity is developed, it can and will spread, if at all possible, to other people also, even other Christians, because prejudice, hatred, is of our real spiritual enemy. That is of the enemy. For Christians to participate in the actions of making false accusations of slander, uh, to treat people with hatred and prejudice, is all sin. And it, for anyone who does that, it can make them come to bear a burden spiritually. You know, there's this, these false teachings, it's just inherent that you're blinded by justifying this sin, morally compromised. And anyone who does that, it can develop a stronghold. The apathy and lack of empathy involved uh, to be cold towards how you would feel if treated in that same way by others. Once you learn that apathy and, and shut down that empathy, it's once you've learned that, it is too easily practiced again and again and again, whether with other Christians or with the lost. 